Yeah. Yeah, we're good. There you go. Thank you. All right, we are going to get started with our, our second to last talk of the afternoon. Um, Christina Gerber, she's been in the wastewater industry for 15 years, has a bachelor's in uh, chemical engineering and a master's in engineering management. Uh, she works for Suez as a biosolids project, project uh, manager. Um, and then outside of the biosolids world, Christina keeps spending time with her family. They can watch Netflix, as do we all. And, <laughs> and, and here she is. Thanks, thanks. I, I just like to throw that little thing in at the end, just because it seems to be a little bit lighthearted and you know, we list all of our, you know, credentials, and we all know everybody's smart in the room, so it, you know, just breaks it up a little bit. So I'm here to talk about, uh, we're shifting gears a little bit. Um, you know, we talked about biosolids, we talked about composting, we talked about precipitation, polymers, everything. And I forgot to make one announcement. I forgot, Malcolm. The, uh, Malcolm's going to be taking the shuttle from the hotel to the metro station for the 508 Baltimore train at 4.30. So if anyone is looking to take the train after that, the shuttle's going to have to wait to come back to the hotel before it goes to the metro station. I apologize. Okay, so back to it. Um, so we're switching gears a little bit. I'm going to talk about biogas, um, you know, from biosolids. So Suez uh, is a leader in the biogas field. We own and or operate about 170 biogas plants all over the world that produces about 1,000 gigawatt hours per year. And out of those, 24% are making biomethane at this time. We anticipate this to go higher um, as the years go on. We have one laboratory that's dedicated to biogas, and this is strictly looking at what inhibits anaerobic digestion, what helps it, what can we do to make the biogas um, pure? So we have the advanced know-how in biogas treatment. So next, talking about biogas. You know, when anaerobic digestion systems first started, a lot of uh, municipal, municipalities would flare their biogas. Then they started realizing like, that this had energy value. So we'll look at maybe conditioning it a little and putting it in boilers. Then we started to see a little bit more rise in CHPs. And now the next step is putting it into natural gas line, um, injection into gas grids, and also uh, CNG. So how do you do that? Um, biogas is, the composition of biogas is about anywhere from 55 to 65% methane, with some impurities of H2S, VOCs, siloxanes, some nitrogen, some oxygen, and but the majority of that is CO2. So in order to get it into a fossil fuel type category, um, you need to remove most of the impurities as well as most of this, the carbon dioxide. So how do you do that? You know, we've already talked about um, the conditioning of it to get out the impurities. Um, but the next step really is how do you get the CO2 out of the system or out of the biogas? And we're going to be talking today about the permeation type, which is membrane, uh, which you can also do absorption, adsorption, and low temperature separation. So our system, um, you can see that this is about the footprint of one. Um, it consists of a um, the, it starts with the um, dryer, because you have to dehumidify the biogas first. Then it goes to an activated carbon system, which will get out your impurities. And the final system is the membranes themselves. And in that, you'll need compressors just to boost it up a little bit. But the point of doing this is to get 99% recovery of your methane, because you want to maximize the revenue for your municipality as well as giving a high value of, of quality of methane, over 97, 98%. So this is, the, this is the overall scheme of how you get there. Like I said, you start with the digester, um, and you upgrade uh, to, the, you send it to the dryer, 
and then you need, usually need to boost it simply because the anaerobic digester is operating in the range of inches of water column rather than PSI. The next is the H2S and VOC treatment, and then compressor and then upgrading system for, um, for the, uh, the, the separation of the CO2 and methane. So like I said, the first step is drier. This kind of just breaks it down a little bit for you of how it's done. Um, which are, you have a chiller, dryer, separator, and then a booster. The next step is removing the H2S, VOCs, and siloxanes. Um, these are done by activated carbon systems, and usually they're set up in a lead lag fashion um, because you want the system to be up and running all the time. So when there is a media change up that has to occur, you send it through one, you send it through uh, filter one, change out number two, and then when the media is installed, you can send it through both again. Oh, I should probably talk about the off gas. So the off gas from stage three, like I said, like if there wasn't a stage three, this would have this stream here would have to go to a thermal oxidizer because of the methane content in it. If you put it into a stage three, depending on the local regs, we can usually discharge direct to atmosphere. Um, we have a plant going into Kansas that is discharging 1.7%. Now, I know that in um, Ontario, they are required to have less than 0.5. And what happens is that you simply just adjust the pressure and quantity of membranes in that third stage to get what is required. So this is how the membrane actually works. Um, you can see that the, the process is by separating um, because of the different permeabilities of these compounds. So the CO2 actually crosses much faster than the CH4. So CH4 will stay in the membrane straws and the CO2 will cross through to the other side to the permeate. It is important to say that this technology is not meant to um, separate nitrogen gas from the system. Most anaerobic systems will have a little bit of nitrogen um, but as for landfill gases, this technology is not recommended simply because it cannot separate the nitrogen out. Um, we uh, usually provide membranes over the whole range of the system. We uh, like to offer um, a, an uptime of over 98% because we want you to set it and forget it. We want this system to just be up and running. We don't really want any, any operators playing with set points or anything. So the quantity of membranes will, will, will be given over the whole range of the facility's uh, maximum and average conditions. So because the system uh, is up and running all the time, it has three control loops that will automatically uh, self-adapt to each other to get the system to be the capacity, quality, and the yield that is required by the injection grid. So it's designed for the three worst control uh, scenarios with the highest flow and the worst quality of gas. And that gives you a robust design with spare capacity. So like I said, you do the highest flow and worst gas quality. So you can see I circled like the highest carbon dioxide content lowest methane, and then the maximum gas flow for this one. So we try to achieve the quality, the yield, and then also the power consumption. We want the power consumption to be low as well. So some of the discussion points that we like to talk about um, is redundancy. These, the compressor that I discussed earlier, you know, it's 240, 270 PSI, it's class one, div one, it's pretty decent flow. So this, you can imagine, is a pretty expensive compressor. So with that being said, it's always important to talk to clients and make sure that if they do want redundancy, maybe we do two 50% uh, compressors rather than one 100%, because these compressors can be on the magnitude of a million dollars. 
<clears throat> so the uh, another thing to talk about is based projects for future expansion. We have a lot of clients that come to us and say that right now this is the biogas we have, but we have spare capacity in our, in our municipal digesters. So could we design later on to add food waste and then have the um, biogas upgrading system? And this isn't because they're membrane modules. Um, it's very easy to add on these membranes. What is a little bit more difficult to do is to increase your compressor capacity um, as well as you know other items. So what we would always recommend is sizing the entire system for the full flow, but then doing the membrane and the um, compressor as, as a later add-on item. So, so this all came about, like I said, because Suez owned and or operated all those biogas plants. And what happened was they started contracting with a company called Protoval. And Protoval was a company, is the company who um, has this unique control scheme of constant self-adapting um, in their algorithms of control and their control panel. So in 1990, Protoval, uh, was created and they were a biogas. So they started out with the Merrick and Shenandoah's where they did biogas um, equipment. Then in 2014, they started doing these, these upgrading systems. <coughs> with that, Suez did over 15 plants with them. And then they decided, you know what? Suez decided, hey, we're going to invest in this company because we really think that this is going to be a big boom in, in equipment supply. And as we know, most of the time Europe is like five to ten years ahead of us. So they, they decided to invest in the in the protocol. And then in 2018, we actually sold our first North American reference. So you can see the different um, references we have. We have a total of 77 right now, um, and they're broken out by municipal, agricultural, and industrial. It's important to note. That even though the majority are less flow in the 400, less than 400 CFM range, it's mainly because the facilities over in Europe are much smaller than the ones we have in the United States. So the North American reference, this is uh, 700 CFM. There's put uh, these biogas to RNG. Um, with a greater than 99.2% methane recovery. We did a fully skidded solution, and it will start up in January. The flow is they had a lot of H2S in their system. They had about 3,000 CFM. So with that being said, we had to do a bulk desulfurization prior to the dehydration. And that's simply because when you do a an iron sponge type bulk desulfurization, you want the biogas to be wet. So we did the bulk desulfurization, then a dehydration, and then a polishing step of the H2S. So that bulk desulfurization got it down from 3,000 down to 100. Then the H2S of VOC siloxanes took it from 100 down to 3. And then we had the three-stage system at the, at the end of it. Uh, another uh, case study that we have is Stratford, Ontario. This is actually a co-digestion project. Um, and this started out with, they currently have two mesophilic existing digesters. And they were sending their wastewater treatment uh, biosolids to it, um, digesting, put it, putting it to land, and then um, biogas. So what they came up with was that their initiative within their uh, their county was that they wanted to divert landfill, waste from landfill. So they had this goal of by 2020, they wanted to divert 30%. By 2030, 50, and by 2050, 80%. So they did this study, and they had this offset natural gas RNG, and they broke it down into what they thought they could make for the natural gas and where it would be coming from. 
So they did all of these greenhouse gas emission um, calculations, and you can see that, you know, I referenced here how they came up with it. But you can see what the equivalents in tons of CO2 per ton of solid food waste, and then the tons of CO2 equivalents per cubic meter of RNG that they came up with. So what they did was they decided that they would put in a biological uh, hydrolysis step, which is a digester enhancement of what they already have. They put in a deep packaging system, and then they took the organic waste of 24,000 tons per year, and the biogas was about 300 cubic meters per hour, and then the biosolids to landfill, or I mean, I'm sorry, to land application. And with that, they actually came up with their making now $2.8 million per year in RNG uptake and tip fees. Diverting, or I mean, I'm sorry, the greenhouse gas uh, emissions, they uh, reduced it by 49,000 tons of CO2 equivalents per year um, for reduction. And what they're doing is they're actually selling it all the way across Canada. So this is, and it's important to note here that this is a co-digestion project. And a lot of the times, you know, we have these um, debates between co-digestion co and co-location. And that's simply because here in the United States, we have the D3, D5 RINs, and they're different. And you obviously get way more for the D3. D3 only applies to biosolids. The D5 applies to the food waste. Now, that's a hot topic most of the time because landfills get the D3s where we don't as food waste digestion. So it is something that the EPA has to um, get on board with and start to really think forward into what we're trying to do. But that is all I have. Do you have any questions? Um, how does that 49,000 tons of CO2 uh, reduction a year equate to the percentage, the 30% mark, the one that's approximately 20? So, so that was for the food waste uh, diversion, and that the number that we saw. The 49,000 was, was equated to that, yes. So obviously that will go up as the years go on and they take more and more. But <coughs> for right now, that is what it is designed for, was that 2030? And the, or 2020, I'm sorry, the 2020. And as time goes on, they are going to need to add more infrastructure. To obviously divert 80% rather than only. Are they close to that 30% though? Yeah. Production is less than 40%, that number goes up. 